has to be done, quick plug before we start. My new book is out on Kindle and paperback. Click the link in the description if you want a copy. This is for all of you guys into Christian apologetics and near-death experiences. And while I have you, like, share, subscribe. Now let's go. Here at a gathering of reformed conservative pastors, the question was asked, how can I be sure that I am among the elect, among the chosen? And this was the response. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, for the sake of argument, say that we are reformed and we agree with their position. A question like this expresses a deep concern about salvation, which we should all have. And that answer is so unsatisfactory. Do I believe enough? Do I believe hard enough? How do I know I'm really believing and not just emotionally excited about this? Because remember, they'll say you can profess Jesus and believe in him, but then if you fall away, you were never a true believer or a true Christian. So this is concerning. And that's the answer. Believe on Jesus. And you put the mic down. Does he really think he's assured anyone of their salvation here? Yeah, the problem is complicated. Well, that was pretty awkward. I feel like the audience may have had the same general feeling I did. But thank goodness, R.C. Sproul is jumping in. Now, I have to tell you, I used to be a Reformed Baptist. And even though R.C. Sproul was Presbyterian, he was definitely a guy I really loved and respected and admired. And was really sad when he passed away. Now, I might disagree with him theologically on well, looking back, maybe almost on everything now, but man, I, I really love his answer and I really respect his answer. And we're going to break that down. Because we have four kinds of people. The people who aren't saved and know that they aren't saved. Uh, people who aren't saved and don't know that they aren't saved. People who are saved and know that they're saved and people who are unsaved, who know that they are saved. That's where the problem comes in, because you have all kinds of people who have a, an assurance of salvation illegitimately. So I overall agree with the four categories, and let's break it down real quick. Category one, those who are not saved and know they're not saved. We can think of some of those people, those who say they don't believe in, in God, and if God did exist, or they were convinced that God existed, they would reject him because they find him repugnant. The second category, where someone is not saved and doesn't know that they aren't saved. I'm not 100% sure who he means in this category. I imagine maybe people from other religions who think they're saved through their religion, and he, he would argue that they are not. Now, don't get upset with the way I'm framing that, because... The church teaches it is ultimately Jesus who saves. Uh, we don't save ourselves. And Jesus can save whomever he wishes. But we, as followers of Jesus, are expected to follow his church and abide by his rules. Category three, those who are saved and know that they're saved. Um, this is a reformed position. They know that they're saved. Uh, but we can have that same kind of assurance because you should have a pretty good idea if you're in mortal sin or not. And if you don't know, go to confession. You probably have enough venial sin to confess anyway. And then category four, those who think they're saved, but aren't. Now, this is a scary category. For a Catholic, I think if someone who's not saved as a Catholic, they're in mortal sin... Uh, they, if they did an actual examination of themselves, they could probably come to the idea that, oh no, I'm in trouble. But they're choosing not to do that. For the Reformed, there seems to be this constant fear of, am I really believing enough? Am I really believing hard enough? I mean, 
I used to pray, Jesus, if, if I have not believed enough, if I haven't repented enough, if I haven't really been saved yet, please save me. What a terrifying way that was to live. But I didn't see it that way back then. Because they don't understand what salvation requires. Maybe somebody taught them if you raise your hand in an evangelistic meeting, or if you walk down the aisle, or if you speak the sinner's prayer, or if you do this method or that method, that guarantees that you're saved. The problem with Reformed Protestant thought, or anyone who believes in this once saved, always saved, is that it's really difficult to know if you're believing hard enough. And you'll never know if you'll ever stop believing hard enough. Even if right now it seems impossible that you would turn away, you don't know how your emotions or your mental state is going to be later in in life. It might truly end up being that you stop believing, no matter how sincere you were to begin with. But the New Testament and Jesus specifically warns us about a false assurance that there were many will come on the last day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? and Didn't we do that? And so on. And he will say those horrible words, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So there is such a thing as a false assurance. He actually misrepresents this passage a little bit. They didn't name all the things that they had done and they should be led into heaven. Jesus says those are the things they didn't do. Then he turns to the sheep and he tells them they were the ones doing those works and they get to enter heaven. Of course, suggesting that works play any role in our salvation at all is completely antithetical to Reformed theology. So he couldn't actually accurately articulate what that passage actually said. That's why we need to know what salvation really is and what it really requires. And then the question is, in my own subjective evaluation, do I meet the requirements as we've just heard? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I will will be saved. And then you say, well, do I really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? How can I sin the way I sin when I know that's not consistent with true faith in Christ. And here we're coming to the crux of the problem that I've been pointing out. When do you know that you're saved and not saved? When do you know that you've believed enough? Yeah, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. But are you doing it good enough? That's the problem there. It's very difficult to ever know if you are in a good state with God. Then you fall into this weird conundrum. Say a man is a devout Christian but then cheats on his wife and lives this lifestyle for several months. And then he repents and comes back to the faith. During the time that he's cheating on his wife, if that would become public, people would say, well, he probably isn't really saved. Just look at the fruits of the life he's living. So was he not saved before he started cheating on his wife? Did he then become saved when he repented? What happens if he falls back into a, a sin? Then is he, was he really not saved the first two times? Or is he, was he always saved even while he was committing those sins, but no one knew it just based on his life? Good news to know that we don't have to be perfect in order to be saved, but we do have to understand who it is that saves us and how it is that we are saved. I... Here we run into yet another problem. If it's really, really simple to be saved, as they're always saying it is, it's very simple to be saved, believe in Jesus, just have faith, then why are there so many complicated twists and turns? Oh, you need to have a proper understanding of Jesus and a proper understanding of what it means to be saved and a proper amount of belief. You start putting all these little caveats onto your simple faith idea. Very practical ways I've I've talked to people who struggle with this question. I ask them, do you love Jesus, the, the biblical Jesus? Do you love the biblical Jesus perfectly? If he's talking about uh, the Jesus of Mormonism, who is a clearly different Jesus than 
the Jesus described in the Bible, or the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who is a very, very, very different Jesus than what is described in the Bible, then I would agree you need to follow the biblical Jesus in order to be saved by Jesus. However, he needs to be careful with the way he's wording this here, because it becomes very easy to say, my idea of Jesus is the biblical Jesus, your idea of Jesus is not the biblical Jesus. And in Protestantism, it's up to every individual to decide what it means to follow the biblical Jesus and who the biblical Jesus is. I've only heard two people in my life who have answered that question in the affirmative to me, who would say, yes, they love him perfectly. That's for the perfectionist problem, it's another story. But <laughs> the vast majority of professing Christians will answer that question. No, they know I don't love Jesus perfectly. I know I don't love Jesus perfectly. Man, what a great question. Because I don't know if there's even been a single moment in my life where I have loved Jesus perfectly. And so I'm sure I can say with Dr. Sproul, and hopefully one day in heaven we can say together, thank you, Jesus, for your grace and love so perfect that mine doesn't need to be. And then they'll say, well, I will say to them, well, do you love him as much as you ought to love him? Well, if they answer the first question, no, they've got to answer the second question, no, because I ought to love him perfectly. And so if I say I don't love him perfectly, then I know I don't love him as much as I ought to love him. So now the spiral seems to tend to be more and more pessimistic. Then I ask this question, do you love him at all? That is a great question. Do you love Jesus at all? Now for Sproul, as you'll see, this is going to mean that there is still salvation for you because you still love Jesus. And as Catholics, we have a, a different view of that in that we can go to the confessional, we can go to God, we can ask forgiveness and have that grace and that love restored even though he never stops loving us, it takes that restoration for us to be able to receive that love again. And so I'm telling you right now, if there's anything holding you back from God's grace and God's love, that door is wide open to you. You just have to walk through it. And I guess I'm talking to myself a little bit here because... I have a hard time walking through those doors and sitting down and confessing my sins. Even though I know on the other side is purity, is holiness, is cleansing. Do you know in your heart whether you have any, any genuine affection for the biblical Jesus? And there's where your theology comes home to roost. If I can say, yes, I know that I don't love them the way I should love them, that I don't love them perfectly, but I know in whom I have believed, I know that I have some real affection for Christ in my heart and in my soul. This is truly a beautiful question because even in the midst of sin, no matter how deeply you're entangled and admired in that sin, you can run to the Father, and He will greet you with open arms. He is waiting for you. Then if my theology is sound, then I ask the question, how could that possibly be? Because I know an unregenerate person has no affection for Jesus and can't possibly have any affection for Jesus. So if I have any affection for Jesus, that tells me I'm regenerate. And if I'm regenerate, I have true faith, and if I have true faith, I'm numbered among the elect. <laughs> and this is where his theology outpaces the Bible. The Bible says that we can turn from God. The Bible says we can lose our salvation. The Bible says that we can go so far as to trample on the sacrifice Jesus made.
And it's possible for people like that to lose their faith and to walk away from the faith and not have any affection for Jesus. And can have a full assurance. That's why, you know, Peter talks about that we should make our election and calling sure that it's a very practical issue because if we don't have the assurance of salvation that we should have and can have, we're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. We're unstable, we're inconsistent, we're duck soup for the temptations of the enemy who comes our way. Again, he falls into the consistent conundrum. This person who is duck soup for the enemy, as he describes it, is that someone who's saved but not sure of their salvation like they should be? Or is it someone who's not saved in the first place? And if they are saved like they they should be, then, and they don't have the assurance, then what does it mean on a practical level for them to be tossed to and fro and for them to fall prey to the tempter? That's why, you know, I look at the difference between Judas and Peter. Jesus says in the upper room to Judas, what you have to do, do quickly. Go do it. And then when he talks about Peter, he says, you're going to deny me. Oh, no, no, not a chance. Simon, Simon, Satan would have you and sift you like wheat. You're s simple, duck soup for Satan. But I have prayed for you so that when you turn, not if you turn, but when you turn, strengthen the brethren. Oh. Oh, is right. He just made a case for Peter's supremacy among the apostles. But that discussion aside, we have a great example here. We have Judas and we have Peter. The Protestant has to say, Peter was always saved. He just turned away from God and came back. But he was still saved that whole time. Meanwhile, Judas was never saved the entire time he was with Jesus. Whereas Catholics cannot make that kind of a judgment. That judgment is up to God. If, he, if Judas was saved and then turned away from him, and then even if he came back to him at the time of his death. And we can't judge that. It's actually easier, I would say, for us to say Peter stepped out of God's graces and then was restored. Then it is to say, that Judas was never saved to begin with. Or, and I know I'm going to upset a lot of traditionalists with this one, or that he didn't get restored before his death. The personal uh, gratification that that gives to my soul is immeasurable. And that's why we have to understand the work of Jesus that he not only is king, but he is our great high priest who intercedes for us every hour of every day. And when the Lord Jesus Christ prays for his weak disciples, there's no question of whether or not they're going to turn. We're capable of serious and radical falls from grace, but never total and final fall because we're being preserved by our Savior. And that's where my assurance comes in. I've only said it a hundred times this video why I disagree with him, why you can turn away from God. But as long as you're still breathing, as long as you have a heartbeat, it is not too late. You can still come back to God. If you are far from him, you can still come back to him. And based on this clip that we've seen, as much as I've interrupted and disagreed with R.C. Sproul, it's easy to see why when I was Protestant and even now, I love this man. Truly, truly has a heart for God and is so evident in this video clip. That's all I have today. Like, share, subscribe, do the whole thing. And as always, 
Thank you, patrons, for your support. You make so many great things possible. I got some new equipment after saving up from the uh, from your generous gifts that you guys provided. And so thank you for helping making this channel better. I've got to say it again because I'm just so excited about it. The link to my book is in the description. You can get paperback or you can get the Kindle version. And if you have any interest in Christian apologetics in general and near-death experiences, this is the book for you. Until next time, and remember, go to Mass. Thank you.